Welcome, my name is Porter Nielsen with Random Artac, and today we're going to be talking about Unity 2017.1's new feature, post-processing. This is a game changer. It is a very useful and powerful feature, so let's dive right in. Go ahead and open up Unity, and there's a few things that we're going to need to do first. So, first thing first, you're going to go up to Edit, and then click Project Settings, Player, and then underneath that you want to change the color space to Linear. You don't want gamma. Gamma kind of looks garbage, but linear also works very nicely. You also want to ensure that HDR is enabled upon your camera and that you go to deferred rendering paths. This will give you the best look. You then also need to download this post-processing stack from the asset store, and then you're going to be able to, to um, add that to your camera. So if you go to your camera in your scene, post-processing behavior, it will be added. You'll see a profile where you need a post-processing profile. So you can go ahead and create that by right-clicking, create post-processing profile. I'm just gonna name this test two. And then I'm gonna go ahead and drag and drop that new post-processing file right there. And it's automatically added. We're gonna go ahead and go through all of these. Um, that's pretty much it if you know how these work. If not, stay around and we'll talk about this. The fog actually doesn't mean you can't enable it or disable it there. You have to go to Windows Lighting Settings and then enable the fog there like you normally would. And so I'm not quite sure why they put that on the post-processing. The debug views, we'll talk about those different ones. You can kind of play around with them and see what they look like. Um, Anti-aliasing. If you zoom in right here, you can see it is very pixelated. Anti-aliasing will just basically smoothen that out. You can change the quality of this. So I can change that up to extreme quality and it looks very, very good. Ambient occlusion is probably one of my favorite ones. Wherever two things meet, it's going to kind of create a shadow. Uh, this happens in real life. If you look in the corner of your room, you can see that it's a little bit darker than anywhere else. So that's post-processing. You can kind of play around with the different settings. Let's go ahead and do that. So crank that intensity up, crank it down, and you can see what that looks like. The sample count, the radius, all those things you can play around with until you get what you like. I'm not quite sure what the downsampling does. It looks like it just makes it softer. Again, not knowing what all these do, you can still play around with them and see what it does. If you go to the debug view, you can actually go to ambient occlusion and see exactly what it's doing. It's multiplying this to your scene. So as you add this, so let's crank this down, you can see that it gets lighter. The radius will make it softer or more, more um, tightly packed around the different things. And so you can kind of get what you like. So I like that. And then I can click none. And then it applies it to your scene just like that. You can turn these on and off. You can layer these. So I can, I'm just going to turn these off as I go. Screen space reflection. You really can't see it in this screen. I wish I had some sort of metal or water, but it basically gives real time reflections. And so you can, you can play around with those until you get what you want. That is an extremely powerful feature. Um, a little bit process heavy, I believe. Depth of field. This one takes a lot of finagling, and if used incorrectly, can kind of make you sick. It makes the foreground and the background blurry, and then the middle ground in focus. You can, you can play around with it. You can change the quality. Cur currently, the kernel size is medium. We can crank that up to high here in a bit, and you'll see it increases the quality of this. But it does give a little bit more realistic um, views. Typically, I like to keep this very subtle. If I'm going to use this in-game, because it can lead to some sickness with some people. Um, me and me in particular, I, I never like games with too much. But if I'm trying to show off an asset, I do like to use the depth of field to give it some depth. Motion blur, um, the shutter angle and sample count, you can play around with that. But the biggest one that I found has effect is this frame blending. If you make that one, it's gonna make it very, very jagged. And so we're gonna actually have to go into game to see this. And you can see, just like that, the the shutter is very big. Okay. Now this is a cool feature. I I dabble in Unreal, and this is kind of out of the box with Unreal. And now that Unity has it, it's getting closer and closer to the Unreal Engine's uh, visual appeal that lots of people like. So as you move this, um, if you move it down like that, it's going to be a much subtler blur. And I appreciate this one a lot more. Um, again, I would like to try and keep this as subtle as possible. Too much can make people sick, but it is a cool effect in first-person shooters or the like. Eye adaption. 
Now, this one takes a lot of playing around with, especially for your scene. But generally speaking, what it does is the human eye, if you enter a dark room, will adjust eventually and it will get brighter and brighter. If you enter a bright room, it will get darker and darker because your pupils dilate. This eye adaptation basically simulates that in game. So it's really cool. Bloom, this is a very well used feature by a lot of games. It makes things glow. So bright objects will grow, glow. You can change the softness and the radius to kind of increase the size of that. Too much almost looks like a volumetric fog. So I would advise not doing that too high. Intensity, don't do it too intense. <laughs> Obviously, some people go too crazy and you get that Star Trek effect of too many you know, lens flares and too much bloom going on. Um, but it does add a lot to the scene, especially if there's something bright like lava or a nuclear explosion or something like that. This next one, the color grading. This is a very technical feature that, so right here, I like none. The other one kind of looks too gray to me, but you can play around with those and see what you like. Um, these have a lot to do with, with Photoshop, has a lot of these same kind of uh, options. Temperature increases or cools. Usually you don't do those too high. Um, a nice little warm thing like that will make something look happier, but you got to be careful because... If you go too far in one direction, you run into the risk of what a lot of games are finding themselves in, where it's it just looks brown. You don't want a brown game. Uh, hue shift. This just takes colors and kind of changes them based on the color wheel. You can affect this via code and kind of get a fun little, like if your player is poisoned or something, you can you you could cycle through this and make it almost a vertigo esque look. So there's some cool things there. The contrast. Um, hue shift, I'm not going to use that much. Uh, saturation, it makes it bright or it makes it a little bit more muted. I will use the black and white much more than I'll use high saturation. You can use high saturation for some like fun cartoony games for sure, but typically you don't want to mess too much with saturation. Contrast is something that you do want to play around with. You don't want a flat looking game. And so a little bit of contrast goes a long way. So it makes the brights brighter and the darks darker. Um, these, the channel mixers, I play around with these a little bit. You can kind of get a color that you want, but I love these trackballs right here. They they do different things, and so you can kind of just affect the different colors. Now, you'll see that it doesn't affect all the colors, right? It doesn't just make the whole scene blue or the whole scene red. You still have greens, and you still have blues, and you still have reds. It just takes the midtones, the dark tones, and the light tones, and starts to apply these colors kind of to them. So you can play around with this. You can scroll down here. So here's a slope. And down below, you can kind of see the monitors. And you can play around with the different monitors to get what you want. Um, but you can affect the brightnesses. You can affect... It's almost the exact same thing as working with histograms within Photoshop. And so this is a very pow powerful tool. I encourage you to... The best way to learn it is to play around with it until you get an effect. See what it does. Play around with the linear and the log. And it can lead to some things, um, really good effects. Make sure you don't overdo it, though, because that just looks bad. Right here, you have some gradient curves. It is all red, green, and blue selected. You can do different channels if you want to. Okay, so I'm just reset all of that now. I'm going to go to the red channel here. I'm going to play around with it. So here's, a, here's all of the channels right there that I'm changing, and I don't want to do that. I just want to select the red curve here. And you can see if you move it up, it makes it redder. If you move it down, it makes it less red. And so you can kind of play around with that and get a, a, a look and a feel that you want as well. If you go to green, you can affect the green and get some really cool colors. Uh, user LUT, user LUT, it's the same thing as color grading, except you have to import a color key. Um, it is rarely used. It's used mostly for mobile games on old, old generation things. And so if you're going to use color grading, chances are you're just going to use color grading. User LUT, if you really do need it, it's so obscure um, in my uses. That's not even worth my time to show you how to do that. But just be aware, that's what it does. Okay. Uh, chromatic aberration. This happens with a lot of cameras where it kind of like along the edges, it blurs like this. And so, again, you don't want to leave this very strong because it'll make it'll make people sick. You can add different textures to it. Um, this texture doesn't do anything. You, you want a black and white texture, uh, trying to find one. 
So right there, as you do it, you can actually see, I don't know if you see that right there, but you can change the aberration based off of the texture. So if you only want in a certain area, you can do that. Grain, just add some granulation. So if you want to look like an old time photo, you could do that. You can change the intensity up and down. A little grain is actually good. Vignette, vignette adds a black um, frame around. It's typically in a circular pattern, but you can use an alpha. So if I do a circle like that, it'll actually mask it so that everything that's not in the mask will be black or whatever color you want. You can change it to whatever color you need. You can increase the intensity, the smoothness. You can make it rounded like that. And so if I'm showing off an asset, I use grain to give it some texture. I use depth of field and I use this. And that's basic and a little bit of ambient occlusion. And that gives me a lot of uh, bang for my buck and it makes assets just really pop. In game, the vignette, I'm not going to use that much. Dithering, dithering is useful. Um, what it does is it breaks up repeated patterns where objects meet. It's a little hard to use. I don't really use it that much, um, but it is there. So let's go ahead and turn on a couple of these. So I have color grading, um, depth of field, bloom, and now I'm going to play this. Let me go ahead and pause this and maximize on play there. There we go. If this makes you sick, I apologize. This actually makes me a little sick. Um, but you can see right there, it looks really cool. But you have to be subtle with the with it. The blur um, in the distance is okay, but the blur up front is is making you a little bit sick. Too much motion blur. Um, it, it's it's just not a good thing. So that's pretty much it. Post processing is now just almost by default, except you have to download it uh, within Unity, which is awesome. I've been waiting for this for so long. So I hope that this was a helpful tutorial. If you like what I do. Go ahead and subscribe, leave a comment below, give us a thumbs up, uh, like the video. If you'd like to support us further, follow us on social media. Everything is um, twitter.com slash randomrattack.com. Uh, we also have a Facebook, same thing, slash randomrattack.com. Also consider following us on Patreon if you like what we, what we do and would like to support us financially. Um, there's a way to do that as well. Thank you so much for your time. Have an awesome day.